earlier than that when he was the mayoral candidate for Johannesburg. We welcome uh, Musi to the studios. Musi, good afternoon and welcome to the studios of Radio Islam. Assalamu alaikum and uh, thank you so much for having me and it's great to be with you and it's great to be with the citizens of this great country. Thank you very much for coming here and taking out the time. We appreciate uh, you on a tight schedule. You've had a long day, but despite all of that, you've come to the studios. Now, the Democratic Alliance launched its uh, election manifesto in Johannesburg on the 23rd of February uh, with the tagline, One South Africa for All. What is at the heart of your manifesto? At the core of it says that we live in a country that in many ways can be described as two countries. There's a South Africa for people who are wealthy and there's a South Africa for people who are poor. And this has manifest itself when you go look for a, a health care. If you've got money, you'll go to a good hospital. If you don't have money, you'll go to a bad hospital. If you've got money, you'll go to a good education. And if you don't, you won't get a good education. And if you've got money, you'll find a good police station. Or in fact, you'll find private security. But as for the rest of the citizens, they don't have adequate policing. So on one end, we are saying that that's not the South Africa we want. We want one South Africa for all. One South Africa where everybody has an opportunity to work. We want to put a job in every home. But secondly, we're living in a country where too many people are starting to divide people. There are political parties standing up saying they're for black people. There are others are saying they're for white people. There are others who are saying they're for this faith or that faith. Surely, our constitution says to all of us that South Africa shall belong to all who live in it. And I'm of the complete view that if we talk about one South Africa for all, we must build a South Africa for all our people, regardless of where they come from, what faith, what God they worship, or what community they live in. That's the South Africa we want to build. Okay, now, looking at the current position of the DA, there are polls, and polls give you some sort of indication. They're not always accurate. But there are polls that suggest that you may lose your support at the election. How confident are you about the DA's chances in the upcoming elections? I'm very confident because actually the DA is the only party that stands for all citizens. And frankly, we have seen growth. We're the only party that can grow in Lanasia as we will in Lefaring. We were the only party that will grow in Santon as we will in Soweto. So frankly, uh, we are, our recent numbers even indicate the fact that the NC is under pressure here in Gauteng. Um, we should be able to form a government here. We're showing great growth in the Northern Cape. We're showing great growth in the Western Cape. So I'm comfortable that the DA is going forward. How much damage did the Dalil saga cause your party, especially in the Western Cape? Well, it depends. I think to call it as damage is, 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 uh, is a misdiagnosis of the situation. I think, frankly, the DA is the only party that says it does not matter how popular you are. It doesn't matter who you are. If we believe that you've done something inherently wrong, we must hold everybody accountable. It doesn't matter who you are. Otherwise, tomorrow, you could do the same situation as Jacob Zuma, where ultimately you say, well, this doesn't suit us electorally, so we'll cover up everything. Or you could say about any other person. I would hope that history, history is going to prove the fact that, in fact, the DA, it doesn't matter who you are, we hold you accountable. That's the, sec the, fact, the second thing I'll say about that particular matter is the fact that where we are on the ground, South Africans are saying to us, we want a government that's competent. Now, it was hard. It took us too long. But make no mistake, it was the right thing to do. And I humbly request citizens to say that in humility, you need to look and say which party actually holds its people to accountable regardless of how painful it is. Talking about holding people to accountable, the DA produced the Stain Asian report, then we drew it, lost it in court three times. It seems as though that you have one set of rules for some leaders and others for others. Not true. First of all, it wasn't the contestation of the Stain Asian report that went to court. Again, I want to make sure the facts are real here. We went to court on the question of procedure. And the judges ruled on the first instance to say you need to keep the same makeup. That's not upon the ambit of the judges to be able to decide on that. The second was on the process of charging, which we were correct to do so, but it questioned the procedure, not the substance of the issue. The substance of the matter has never been interrogated and should be interrogated, given the right set of circumstances. We should look as to whether did Patricia Dill, in fact, send out an SMS appointing people ahead of time. 
which is the allegation. We should look at the fact that the council has already removed two contracts since she's been removed that were illegally adjudicated. The council itself, which he led, has already adjudicated on those matters. So I think that we need to get the facts between what in fact took place and what was being interrogated here. And I'm comfortable to know that the court processes, to me, were procedural, not substantive. And it's well within the courts to be able to judge on, on procedure. But they haven't applied themselves on the substance of what in fact the issues are. In your launch in, uh, for the Gauteng election manifesto in Pretoria last month, uh, you are quoted as saying that coalition government led by the DA is said to be the future of the country. After the municipal elections, you entered into a coalition with the EFF, which crumbled in Nelson and Bay. Bay. What possessed you to rely on the EFF to form a minority government? I think it's important to note that South Africa will be led by coalitions in the future. The DA is an essential part of that. The NC itself is a coalition. We've had a culture of one-party rule for years. And one-party rule has brought us state capture, it's brought us VBS, it's brought us corruption. In Joburg alone, 18 billion rands were stolen. In Chwani, ward councillors of the ANC and branch members were being employed in the mayor's office that they ended up with over 900 people running one office, which other municipalities run them out of 20 or 30 people or 50 people. We safeguarded the people of Johannesburg, billions and billions of rands. Therefore, to your question, it's not a possession, and neither are we in a formal coalition with the EFF. They agree with us on certain matters, and when they disagree with us, they don't vote with us. We're in coalitions with parties that we have a coalition agreement with, COPE, ACDP. Uh, in fact, I think uh, there are a number of IFP. Those parties stood together and said, we will prioritize service delivery for the people, we will deliver for the people, and that's happening. So had it not been for that, Joburg would have been in a much worse place. Not to come to Nelson Mandela Bay. Imagine tomorrow morning someone stands up and says, because of your faith or because of the color of your skin, they want to cut the throat, your throat off. Would you stand for that? Would you agree to it? Would you say that's something that you should uphold in a constitutional democracy? So when Mr. Malema said he wants to cut off the throat of whiteness, it's not about the race of the person. It's about the fact that that is a discriminatory statement against anybody. Tomorrow it's about race. Tomorrow it could be about something else. Therefore, we need to stand for principle. They removed us. They've set up a government there. Another coalition with Mongameli Bobani, who the Hawks raided last night in his house, seeking information from somebody who correctly, in the long run, should ultimately end up in jail, is my humble opinion. So frankly, I think what's important to note is you spoke to residents of Nelson Mandela Bay, they would tell you life was better under a DA-led coalition than what is going on now. If we think that coalitions are not going to work in this country, we've got a long way to go because what we want to do then is entrench one party state over a long period of time. And that will mean that state capture will become the order of the day. I would fight for coalitions, stand for them, so long as you've got a plan. And we're the only party now that's got experience for it. The NC here could be out of power. Yes, I'm not here to say they will lose from whatever they add now to zero. So they might have to form coalitions, or we might have to form a different coalition nationally. We've got the experience, the lessons that we've learned to be able to execute that coalition so it works for the people. Joburg and Chwane are living models of the fact that actually they do work. So do you regret the coalition with the EFF? I'm not in a formal coalition with the EFF. The EFF vote when they need to vote for us. I'm in a formal coalition with other parties. There's a coalition agreement. I don't have a coalition agreement with the EFF. And therefore, in future, I think it's important to note that we run a minority government in Joburg. If we're in a formal coalition, we'd be having a different conversation. And therefore, I also do think it's important to note the arrangement that you did have with the EFF, which resulted in Ethel Trollope being uh, voted in as mayor of Port I Elizabeth. don't regret it because for those two years, jo uh, Nelson Mandela Bay was a much better municipality. Today, the EFF has changed its tune, so it might be better to have a conversation with the EFF. Why did you flip-flop? Why did you today decide that you reject corruption in the ANC, but you'll put corruption in the UDM? That's a better conversation to have. Here in Joburg, we're showing that we are eradicating corruption. In Chwane, we are eradicating corruption. This is about the people. We should always put the people at the center of it. Now, do I, share, do I share views with the EFF? No, I don't. 
Do I think that the EFF um, as a party will uphold a one South Africa for all? I don't. I think that they have an agenda that is particularly dangerous. But at the same time as that, when it comes to local government, where you can be challenged to deliver for the poor, you must be able to do so. And frankly, Joburg has been able to pass a budget that now has more clinics open longer, for longer periods of time than it's ever been before. We now have more policemen on the roads to make sure that we fight against criminals and make sure drug dealers are put behind bars. Today, Joburg, we have inherited billing crisis of over 200,000 bills, and now we've reduced them to just under 15,000 bills. Therefore, I do think that we must see what the progression has been made and recognize that it would not have been possible had people not gone into the coalition as we have it. So with the upcoming elections, uh, is there a possibility that you may enter into a coalition with the EFF? Not formally, no. Because I can tell you that now, that we don't share common values. I will do what is right for the citizens of our country. When they voted, 38% of them said the DA should lead. They didn't give us enough. I'm asking the people of Gauteng to give us more. Because then we don't have to depend on people like the EFF. You know, we've never implemented EFF policies, but the NC, even without being in a coalition, talk about EFF policy permanently. Expropriation without compensation, nationalization of the Reserve Bank, nationalization of the health care, uh, the nationalization of your pension fund. So these are policies of the EFF that the NC are already practicing. So for us, we're simply saying, if you want a market-based economy, where citizens like yourself and any other individual wants to run their business can have the freedom to do so, a non-racial South Africa upon which all citizens have equal rights, a country upon which uh, we will build a capable state, a constitutional country, and the eradication of corruption, then they must realize that the DA is the only party that will do that. And if you want to pull people in the right direction, that would be the direction, because we've shown the fact that when you do that, jobs are created, our citizens are empowered, and ultimately we can live in a much freer country. There's been a poll by uh, Citizen, which is not the newspaper, Citizen Surveys, as well as uh, SAFM Breakfast, which indicates that Helen Zeller is still more popular amongst the DA uh, members or supporters than yourself, and this poll is available on the internet, 58% more popular. How do you feel about that, that there's an individual within your own party who's more popular than yourself? I think it's best to ask Helen Zilla that question, and she answered it brilliantly. Her response was as follows. Helen Zilla said, Musi Maimane has led the DA to more metros, more communities, more growth. Therefore, we need to stop thinking about these comparisons and focus on the next victories. That is obviously it is natural for people to look back at some point and say, oh, well, that leader in the past has done this and that. They don't, they're not piloting the thing as we sit right here today. So I'm not worried about those polls. The former is always better. It's common cause. You attend any, any funeral, you'll see it for yourself. People are always brilliant, post. When you are in the job, you've got to make tough decisions. You've got to make decisions that are unpopular. I'm not here to win a popularity contest, I'm here to lead. And I have to lead a party that unites all South Africans, regardless of where they come from, and focus on tomorrow. I have respect for Helen Zilla. She's contributed immensely to our party. She served her time and she's very supportive of our leadership. This is not the debate. The debate is about the future. So what role does she play in the DA now? She's still the Premier of the Western Cape and finishing her term. Uh, what we've seen in terms of leadership within the DA is that the DA successor, Mayor Intswane, uh, says that his predecessor left him with a mess. Uh, is that true? The person, Simang, now that is the DA Premier candidate for Gauteng, so now why should we trust he's going to do a good job when his own party member is saying that he left a mess in Swane? Frankly, that's not true. It was a, so, mis it was a misstatement from uh, a, a radio station who reported on that information. You must read the council speech that was delivered by the mayor of Swane, who has reiterated without equivocation to say that there was a legacy that was left by Solim Simanga that he's continuing to build on. Solim Simanga began a fight against Glad Africa. The current mayor is continuing on that. Solim Simanga began a journey on service delivery. The current mayor is continuing on that. And now what we need is a Gauteng that is led by a premier candidate that will ensure that it works with both those cities, Chwane and Nelson Mandela Bay, so that we can in fact deliver more services for our people. 
looking at uh, you know the campaigning and uh, you always speak the DA speaks about uh, their track record of, of governance and let's look at Johannesburg and Tswane uh, you going to say that you've delivered uh, you know uh, longer hours of the clinics and you've delivered title deeds and things like that but frankly speaking when I speak to my listeners Joburg is still a mess on what basis do you say that people are not happy with the way they've de services have been delivered to them in Indonesia nothing has changed whether it is the ANC or the DA that was governing in Asia it's still the same and we can open the lines and you'll find that sort of a I'll sentiment make, coming through I'll make a challenge when you come into a government that is 18 billion rands in the red to turn that ship around is not a question of two years I think that would be fair to say that and I think your listeners and your voters would know that what I can say to the people of Lanasia is simply this, that Lanasia isn't, there are multiple communities in Lanasia. Let's be honest about that. And when you think about what are some of the things that need to be done, when we inherited a deficit, now we've just helped pass a budget that gives us an additional 700 million rands, that we can at least electrify and form more settlements, that we can at least ensure that we keep the lights on. Already Joburg has already put a power station now at cheap by the price that will make sure the lights do stay on. We are working on a plan over a long period of time to turn things around. And I want to say, of course, I'm a resident of Dobsonville, which is not far from Lanasia. It's the next suburb on. When I go home, other things that I'm, I can see improvements in, yeah. Other things I'm not happy about, of course. Do I get frustrated? Yes. But I mustn't sit back and say that if you've had 20 years of neglect, you're going to fix it in two. It cannot be. We must wait. We must work hard. We must work together. And I'm inviting the people of Lanasia. I want to say to them, your public representatives, the people you voted for, you need to continue to hold account. I need to make sure that all of these issues keep being raised. Because I want a government that will work for the people. And I know there's a resolute commitment from Herman Mashaba and the team here to continue to deliver for the people. Why are you so adamant that President Ramaphosa must answer questions about his son's dealings with Posasa? Is it because the DA has lost the golden goose that provided you with the voters in Jacob Zuma and needs something to negate the Ramaphosa effect? My issue is not with President Ramaphosa. My issue is with the criminal syndicate called the NC. How do we sit in a country where every night we watch state capture and people have got money being given to them? bribe packs, selling off our people. And then we must sit back and say, oh well, nothing is wrong here. How do we sit when a president comes and says one thing one week in parliament, then the following week he says something different? Why should we treat Mr. Ramaphosa any different? You see, it's the same sort of problems that are created when we have differential treatment. Why did the charges against Zuma become dropped? They became dropped because they said it wasn't politically palatable. This was a man who was going to become the president of the ANC and therefore the president of the country. Let's drop the charges. Today, we are saying, oh, wait, here's a man who's coming now. We must look after Mr. Ramaphosa. If he's done something wrong, he must account like any other citizen. Because today, it's him. We used to have Babaga Tutuzani. Now we've got Babaga Andili. Mr. Ramaphosa has, has, in Parliament, told two different versions of the story. His son is admitting that he's, he's receiving money from a Bosasa company that gets contract. Here's the triangle. Here's how it works. Here's how the root of corruption works. You, as a company, go and buy yourself a president, 500,000 rands. That person gets elected to presidency. They make sure business dealings come back to your company and you give more dealings to their children. That's how the triangle works. Mr. Ramaphosa is just repeating the same old script. And therefore, it's not about me trying to lay some golden goose that lays the egg. Corruption is but one issue in this country. My number one problem is this. 40% of households in this country don't have a single income going into them. What kind of South Africa is that? 10 million of our citizens are unemployed. That's a bigger issue. Let's face facts. 50% of the young people in this country will never be able, cannot find work. And the longer they cannot find work, they will never be able to find work. Is that the country you want to live in? Where young people start school, but they don't finish school? Surely, if you want to talk about golden goose issues, as you put them, we should be at the center of that conversation. That's the conversation. What is the ANC's greatest crime? It isn't Bosasa. Their greatest crime is that they've left our kids unemployed, which means they've stolen the future of our country. 
That's what we should be looking at. And therefore, what is the DA's focus must be solely on the fact that here are South Africans whose future has been robbed, stolen away from them. We've had a repeated denial of construction of Muslim prayers of uh, places of prayer facilities in areas across South Africa. Uh, and the rejection comes mostly from DA councillors or DA run wards, Valhalla, uh, Westering in Port Elizabeth, Belito in KZN. Why is it the case that it is in DA run wards or by DA councillors? Again, we must always get the facts when we talk about these issues. Always, always get the facts. The matter in Belito was very clear. The councillor, in fact, stated categorically that, in fact, they were supportive, they needed community consultation. And off they did. The councillors never voted against the item. There's a whole story going around it. Saying, no, the council voted against it. Not true. We cannot perpetuate propaganda and make it facts. It's not. We have a law in this country. That law is applicable to black people, white people, Indian people, Christian people, Muslim people. It doesn't matter who you are, the law applies. It should be that way. And we've been supportive of mosques being built. I can take you to council after council. I can take you to Cape Town. I can take you to Joburg. Where there's been thorough consultation, there's been a process upon which citizens have the right to say what they feel like say. This is not a, no party. And here's the good news. You know why I love the deer? Because in the deer, it's the only party where a Muslim can sit with a Jew and share a meal and have a discussion about the future of their country. Other parties want to divide both faiths. That's a fact. I'm here to say, while we negotiate these things, we're going to find solutions that work for all citizens. And therefore, ultimately, that's not purport to say that the DA is opposed to the building of mosques. Actually, quite the contrary. What we are supportive of is to make sure that all the public consultation is done well. Because tomorrow it's not going to be about a mosque. It could be about any other public policy issue. It ought to be upheld. On the Human Rights website, it is written that uh, Israel is, uh, has violated at least five international laws uh, in terms of occupation, unlawful killing, forced displacement, abusive detention, the closure of the Gaza Strip, unjustified restriction of movement, etc. Now, when Sir Ramaphosa uh, was, uh, you know, met with uh, Mohammed bin Salman, and you put out a tweet and you said, Mr. President, I mean no disrespect, but I hope you had time to discuss media freedom, the protection of journalists, and why values of freedom are being threatened all over the world. Just be careful to be judged by the company you keep. And then you go and take a photo and stand alongside and visit Israel on the invite of the Zionist uh, uh, state. And you take a picture alongside with him. It seems as though you didn't heed your own advice. Firstly, I think we mustn't obfuscate facts. We mustn't merge issues and make them one. I'll take you step by step. On the first image you've got there, I met the Palestinian Authority. I met... Mr. Netanyahu, just because you got an image of me and Mr. Netanyahu does not mean that I didn't visit both Palestine and Israel. I met with both sides. Because I am the only leader in this country still standing up for a two-state solution. Now we may disagree on the nuances of all of that. But that's a South African position. That's the position we must advance. The second issue about media freedom. I could not be bothered what side of the fence you sit on. It is a value we must hold. All of us must uphold. I bet you if I sat here with the Palestinian Authority, they would stand up for the fact that journalists ought not to be killed. I don't think anyone is standing up saying journalists must be killed. It would be wrong if Israel did it. It would be wrong if MBS did it. It would be wrong if any leader was doing it. Therefore, my question there still remains. Make sure. I challenged Mr. Netanyahu, you can speak to his office. I said to him, what are you doing about this Palestinian situation? And are you dealing with a two-state solution and how are you advancing it? As much as I did the same for the Palestinian Authority and as I would do the same for MBS himself. Therefore, I think we mustn't try and obfuscate facts here. My principal position remains true. I believe in a two-state solution and I will advance the fight to make sure that all rights of journalists, of media, of freedom will always be a So would you meet MBS? With pleasure.
and so, challenge the same issues. So then what are you saying here? Just be careful I'm to be judged saying, by the company you keep. Oh, absolutely. I'll go out there and challenge the issues with him. I would challenge those issues. So then what, my what message state, are you giving tweet, to Sir Ramaphosa then? My tweet is, Mr. President, I mean no disrespect. Point number one. Don't disregard that. Secondly, I hope you had passed me the tweet so I can read it properly. I hope, I want to read it for the viewers. I hope you had time to discuss media freedom. Did he do that? Did he just simply endorse a position here? If we want to be principled individuals, it doesn't matter whether I meet with a person I vehemently disagree with. I must challenge the issues. The South African government has a history of keeping company with people. They sat here and they kept com company. You want to talk foreign policy? Here's the president of South Sudan, a man who's accused of genocide against our people. It was this government whose courts, the South African courts, have found against the, the South African government to say you let a person exit this country without any accountability. You mean I uh, Sudan, North Sudan? North Sudan. Yes. Omar I'm Omar al-Bashir. Al yes. Same instance. We can't sit here today and allow a government that when it matters the most, when you must stand up for issues, media freedom is crucial. I've asked the president of Zimbabwe. Right now in Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwean government, I've got MPs living in exile out of their own country. The president of Zimbabwe has sanctioned and allowed an army to go against its own people. Do I want to meet with the president of Zimbabwe? Yes. Do I want to challenge for issues of freedom? Yes. Meeting is one thing. Challenging issues is another. My statement here still holds. Just be careful to be judged by the company you keep. Ask the questions. Challenge the issues. But for us, where's the proof that you raised those issues? There's no official correspondence. We, when we read DA correspondence, we find that they speak about the perpetrator and the, those against it being perpetrated in one particular tone, that we condemn what uh, the one party is doing, we condemn what the other party. So uh, here, uh, that is the type of message that we get. It's very neutral. What does your manifesto say about the issue of Palestine? We should have a two-state solution. No country should be allowed to break laws, international laws. That includes Israel. But what we cannot do is shy away from the simple fact. If the state of Palestine must exist, so should the state of Israel be able to exist. Otherwise, it's not a two-state solution. And what does it say about the violations of the Israelis violating Palestinians' rights? I've never shied away from condemning anyone who violates human rights of any kind. I've stood firmly and I've said it quite clear. When there was a massacre that took place, we stood up and we spoke up against it. I never shied away from that. Uh, we know we've run out of time. Finally, uh, President, uh, candidate for the country, what is your message to listeners of Radio Islam listening all parts of the country? Why should they vote for the DA? They should vote for the DA because if anyone is going to protect their rights, their rights to serve and to worship whichever God they so choose, their right to be able to know that their freedoms are protected, to build one South Africa for all, to make sure that we don't live in a country where so many of our citizens don't have a job, to have a government that is clean and delivers for all our people. The only party that can do that, has done it, will do it, is the DA. It's the only future we have. We must talk about a future for South Africa, and that future must be a post-liberation movement of the ANC and focused on a tomorrow where we can all prosper together. So if you want that leadership, you want that future, I would urge you, to vote for the DA and bring about the change. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Musi. I appreciate uh, the uh, length at which you've answered our questions this afternoon. Thank you very much and all the best. And we look forward to chatting to you again. It's 23 minutes past four Central African time. Thank you. Thank you.